Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We're in Acts chapter 14, and Acts 14 is probably my favorite chapter of the book. And uh, at the end, we will officially be halfway through our last full book in the New Testament to look at. Again, we'll have to look at first, I think it's like six, seven chapters of Hebrews to, to say we looked at every chapter of the New Testament. But in terms of the last book, uh, this is it. So we're about halfway through. There's only 28 chapters. Acts is one of the longest books. Uh, may be the longest. I'm, I'm not sure. Regardless, what we have here is is the pattern continuing that we saw yesterday. Um, you remember that Paul enters cities. He goes to synagogues, uh, preaches Christ. Some believe, but then an influx of critics comes and pushes Paul out. And here we see it in a much more violent way. Paul was able to escape in previous uh, cases. Now uh, he is abused. And uh, it, it begins here in verse 1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue uh, and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. And the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so th- there we see, we see the entrance of the synagogue and um, both Jews and Greeks in the synagogue uh, believe. This is uh, reminiscent, again, what we saw in chapter 13. However, unbelieving Jews stir them up, and I love this language, poison to their minds against their brothers. And so uh, they convinced everyone that was listening to Paul that he was, in fact, uh, a villain. Uh, he was poisoning their minds. He was robbing them of their faith, and therefore had to be stopped. Um, verse 5, just to skip. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of uh, Lycanoa, uh, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So they escape in Iconium only as we'll find to find the same situation in Lystra and Derby that is actually much more violent. So, so far, Paul, uh, he preaches and people respond, and then critics come, his enemies come, and threaten him with abuse uh, and violence. And so he's, he's been able to escape that. Uh, so he, he speaks with boldness and care, knowing that this is going to happen. Yet he speaks nonetheless. Uh, but then we, we see in verse 8, Now at Lystra... There was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in in the local language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. This is a wild story. So Paul comes and performs a miracle. He sees someone suffering and crippled, and so he heals that person. This is reminiscent of what we saw Peter do in Jerusalem a few chapters before. But now Paul is doing it in a predominantly Gentile area um, and uh, in demonstrating the grace of God, hoping this would launch... Uh, presentation of the gospel, but actually the opposite seems to happen. People see the miracle. They can't deny it, and so they respond by assuming what you have here is Zeus and Hermes. Now, we know from um, historical research that there is precedent for this. This makes sense that Lystra would do this and not Antioch or Jerusalem. The reason is because there was a myth um, at the city of Lystra that Zeus and Hermes had come and visited uh, the city, and no one would take them in. Uh, They presented themselves as impoverished and homeless, uh, except I I believe it was a farmer or someone took them in, and so they rained judgment down upon the rest of the city. And so the city kind of lived in this constant fear that Zeus and Hermes were going to come back, and when they did, they were going to go out of their way to honor them. So here you have uh, two people. One is a speaker, one is a healer, and and they 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 heal this guy who everyone knows has been crippled since birth. And so they assume, based off of the narratives and the myths they grew up with, that this must be the fulfillment of those prophecies. And so they have to go out of their way to honor them. Well, as you can imagine, um, they they think, no, 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 don't, don't do this. We're not who you think they are. 
uh, who, who you think we are. And they're doing this in a language foreign to Paul and Barnabas. They, everyone speaks Greek. Uh, that was the universal language. Also, there was a local languages and dialects. You also notice this is a, an inversion of what we saw at Pentecost. Uh, is, is now they're, re, they're, they're reverting back, not to, not to the unity we have in the gospel, but back to tribalism. Right? And, and this is what paganism will, will ultimately do, religion in, in general. We're seeing that with woke religion. You've heard me say that a thousand times already. Verse 15, this is what they say. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And then he goes to, to continue to articulate that they're not gods. Rather, they've come to direct them to the God who has come down in the person of Christ to, to offer them grace and forgiveness. Verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. Now, what, what a wild narrative this is. Uh, this is why I just find chapter 14 so fascinating. Uh, verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. So, so notice what, what, what happened here. They go from, from, I guess you could say one high, I guess it would be a low theology, but one high of being honored to the point of being a god, to the low of being executed and dragged outside of the city for the buzzards to consume them. I mean, that's that's from one peak to one valley, uh, I guess. And um, and we should also note, it's not the people of Lystra doing this. It's rather their enemies from these other cities, uh, from Antioch and Iconium, because we just saw it came from Iconium, where, where they were threatened. And so what they have is they're being followed by their critics. Um, this is essentially Twitter in a nutshell. Is, is, is that fair? Um, one of the things I've found um, fascinating, I've, I've lived in cities, I've lived in rural areas, I grew up in a rural area. One of the great things about rural areas is everybody knows you. They know your family, they know your history, and, and, and if you're part of that town, then, then it really is a home. At the same time, if you cross some sort of line, do something that goes against acceptable behavior in that local community. You're, you're a bit of a, a pariah. So anywhere you may go, uh, uh, particularly from a minister's perspective, is, is that would, that, that, that'll follow you. So too, what you see here is there is a pattern, because uh, these cities are all kind of near each other, that, that Paul's critics and his enemies are following him raising accusations, stirring up the crowd, threatening his, his, his life. And so he goes from being honored as a god, though he didn't want that, to uh, being executed. I mean, it's just, just, it's just incredible that this is what you see in verse 19, what we call malice, an uncontrolled rage that is beyond reason, where, where they are driven by hate to where they will not stop until you are destroyed. Th that is Twitter in a nutshell right now. This, this is cancel culture in a nutshell right now. It, it isn't enough that, that you be corrected. You must be destroyed and your family with you. Right? This, this is what, what you're having here. And Paul is falling victim to this sort of malice. Malice comes from hate. And we live in a culture of hate. So it goes on, um, they drag him out of the city, supposing he, he was dead. He, he, um, and when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered back into the city. Now that is manhood, right? <laughs> I mean, none of us would do this. None of us. At other places, he simply wiped the dust off of his feet. Here, he picks himself up, goes back into the city, and on the next day, uh, he went with Barnabas to, to Derby. And we discover what he does is he, he appoints elders and all that, all that sort of stuff. It's incredible, the boldness and, and everything. Don't think that Paul just wakes up and says, well, well, that was odd, and just walks in. No, he's dragging himself in. He is wounded and needs to be cared for, but he can't stay there. He's unwelcomed. So here he is all alone having to find Barnabas in Derby as a, as a wounded, nearly dead man. Now, some scholars, um, I, I don't think it's, it's as popular now as it was um, previous generations, 
um, because I don't think the math works. But for much of history, you'll find scholars and theologians and thinkers and commentators and stuff suggest that you remember when we read in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 12, where Paul has that vision where he's caught up into the third heaven, whether in the body, out of the body, he doesn't know. We, we looked at that because uh, we looked at everything in the New Testament, practically. So you, you can go back our, our discussion of it. Uh, but Paul says he, had, he was caught up into the third heaven. Well, some believe that happened right here at Lystra, that it was a sort of um, almost like a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience. And, and although that's an attractive option, it's unlikely. The math doesn't work, work out. So if you take the details we get from 2 Corinthians and you get the details we get here, the dates simply don't, don't work, work out. Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, look, it was, I think, 12 years ago, whatever it was, and it just doesn't work out. Uh, it would be fascinating if that was the case, but uh, unlikely. Verse 23, when they had appointed elders for them in, in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed to them to the Lord in whom they had believed. It's fascinating. So Paul goes in and he appoints elders. Right? He, he's going to plant the church. And, and he says, you've got the foundation of the gospel. You've got the scriptures. And, and here are some, some men here who can serve you as elders. Um, and, and there he plants the church to, before move, moving forward. And what's fascinating is, who are the people praying and fasting for, for Paul? They're new believers. Saved under his preaching in his ministry. It's beautiful, isn't it? It really is. Well, uh, they leave there and they return to Antioch. I just want to read the last two verses there. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared uh, all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and remained no little time with the disciples. Uh, so, so what you have here is uh, Paul's first missionary journeys come to, come to the conclusion. I, I believe that's, that's the way we see this. And... Um, he returns to the church and sent him out. So Antioch is the, the, the missionary church in Acts. And others are doing it, of course, but in Acts narrative, Antioch is, is a key location. They're the ones that send Paul and Barnabas out. And so they, they've supported him, and now he comes back to give a report. So I have no doubt he has a slideshow, right? And, and he's taken up the Sunday evening service to talk about this. Um, and what he says is fascinating. He doesn't come in and say, guys, look, I'm done with this. Everywhere I go, they try to kill me. I'm doing something wrong. Go send someone else. No, what he goes and says, look, you're not going to believe this. Yeah, despite all of that stuff, God is opening doors. He's redeeming hearts. And churches are being planted in, in, in areas that have never heard of the gospel. We'll suffer well. And we'll keep suffering. If God keeps doing stuff like this, it's worth it. What an amazing perspective. Would you give a report like that? I'm not sure many of us would. Hope to see you guys here tomorrow. Let me just say thank you for, for those that have allowed us to be here at the office today. Um, it is still super cold. I went out running in 16 degree weather yesterday. It is super cold outside. It's even colder now. And um, I'm thankful for a few members in particular that helped clear off our parking lot. So that, we, so that we could be here today. So shout out to them. Hope to see you guys hopefully here um, tomorrow, but I don't know what the weather's going to do. Had two migraines over the weekend, so it's just going to be a bad week. So hopefully we'll see you guys online tomorrow. Have a good one.